Well, John Gallagher, you're going to be on the Emmy ballot twice this summer, once for uh, Olive Kitteridge and once for the newsroom, uh, both on HBO. Tell us, let's start on Olive Kitteridge, since that was the most recent, and that was in the uh, the movie uh, miniseries category. Yeah. How did you get that role as the son of um, Francis McDormand and Richard Jenkins? You know, I, I was finishing up the second season of The Newsroom, and I was filming that in Los Angeles, and my agent sent me the script for Olive Kittredge, and um, I had heard of the book. I, my mother had just read the book and really loved the book, and so I was aware that it had that it was a very moving, emotional, simple story about a family in a small town in Maine. And I read the script and knew very, very quickly that it was going to be something special. I'm a huge fan of Francis McDormand's work and a huge fan of Richard Jenkins. And Richard and I have the same agent, <clears throat> and so she, you know, had her fingers crossed that we were gonna that we were, I was gonna get the parts so that we could work together. But initially, I had I had been sent both roles. The role of Christopher Kittredge, which I ended up playing, and the role of uh, Kevin, that was uh, brilliantly portrayed by Corey Michael Smith. And um, I couldn't really decide between the two characters, and so I went in and they had me read both of them. Uh, I think they weren't they weren't sure um, how they wanted to kind of cast it. And I went in and uh, and auditioned for Lisa Cholodenko, the director, and for Steve Shiresi, the producer. And I was very sick. I had a cold. I remember. And it, it didn't go so great. You know, sometimes you have a feeling where you're like, oh, I, I think that was a pretty good audition. And then sometimes you go, oh, man, I, I wish I could do that one over again. And uh, fortunately, they called me back in about a week later to go in and reread all of the Christopher scenes. And so I went in again and auditioned a second time. And then a couple of days later, I flew to Los Angeles uh, to go to the premiere of um, of Newsroom, season two is premiering in LA, I think in July. So this was over the course of a couple months that I had auditioned for it after having read the script. And uh, in a nice little piece of kismet, I discovered that I um, got the part for Olive Kittredge at the premiere um, for the Newsroom. And a couple of uh, people that worked at HBO came up and Michael Lombardo you know, came up to me and, uh, and he said, hey, congratulations. I'm really excited that you're going to do it. And I didn't know what he was talking about at first. I just thought that he was saying congratulations on the premiere of season two. Isn't this great? But then I checked my email and saw that I had been, in fact, offered the role of Christopher Kittredge in, uh, in Olive Kittredge. And so it was, uh, that was really exciting because, I mean, HBO, I've been a fan of their programming for years and uh, just love the work that they do. And, uh, and working under their umbrella for the last several years has been a total treat. It's been really great. They take really, really good care of everybody that works there. And I think that they, they, they're pretty fearless in uh, taking on all kinds of material, all kinds of subject matter with their documentaries, with, the, you know, with their TV series and with the miniseries. So it was just a total joy. I was, uh, I was, I was so excited when I got that email and found out that I got the part in the kitchen. Well, for people that haven't seen it yet, this is not your happy-go-lucky kind of material. This, no. <laughs> this is some dark family material, and your character, whether or not it's true, he believes that his mother especially has been the, the main cause for his depression and his, his sort of um, the life that he now leads. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It has, it, you know, it, it has all of these kind of elements of, you know, of, of, in the great tradition of, of American drama, like Eugene O'Neill or, you know, something like that was the, something that I kept thinking of when I read the, when I read the script and when I went back to dive into the source material. Yeah, it's, it's from, the, from the surface, it looks like a very kind of simple homespun, homespun story about a, a kind of a quintessential um, American family, but you start diving in deeper and realizing that there's, you know, years of pain and secrets and resentments and all the things that are just you know, very natural to humanity. They really get uncovered in a in a very kind of beautiful and organic way in the way that the story is told in uh, in Olive Kittredge. And um, you know, Francis McDormand just gives, for my money, is what's one of the most tremendous performances I think I've ever seen um, on film. She just she jumped right in and was so unafraid to to be tough and to be unlikable and to ultimately be lovable at the same time, which is a really hard balance, um, but she did it. The scenes with you and her, especially in, in New York uh, toward the end, uh, where she comes to visit, 
Uh, one thing I really noticed about your performance was, and I'm sure this was you and the director talking about it, but there's so many moments where you're doing your lines, but you can't even look at Francis's character. You, you just have to look away. You can't even look her in the eye. Yeah, definitely. That was something that, you know, just started kind of happening naturally. The idea that this guy is is finally coming to terms with the fact that he has all of he has all of this anger, you know, that that he has for uh, directed towards his mother and, and finally, you know, he's he's going to say something about it after years of of deal of wrestling with it and trying to figure out how he feels. He finally has figured out how he he feels. And so it's almost like, you know, the letting the you know, the floodgates open for all of that anger and frustration and hurt uh, and pain. And so it's it's kind of coming out of him almost faster than he can keep up with it. You know, you think he's trying to stay on top of it and be measured because he's in therapy now and and he's been working through through all of these feelings and kind of figuring them out. And, and uh, you know, so she, said, she even says at one point in the scene, I think she's, you know, she's like, don't talk to me like, uh, you know, like you're my psychiatrist, you know, I don't want to, don't want to hear your, um, your kind of prescription, you know, of, of how I am or, or what it is that I need. Uh, and so, yeah, I think uh, he's, he's um, trying to be, you know, I, it, it's a, with a lot of bravery, you know, I think it takes a lot of bravery to, to stand up to someone uh, and and be and be that honest, that brutally honest about the way that they're making you feel. But those scenes were, you know, they were they were juggernauts to film because they're really long and they're really intense, and there's a lot of dialogue and there's a lot of back and forth. And uh, you know, fortunately, Francis and I have, have both done a lot of theater, and you know, my kind of muscles are already stretched from doing two years of you know working with Aaron Sorkin dialogue, which is quite verbose. Uh, and so we just kind of jumped in and, and teared into that scene. And I just remember after the, after one, the one, there was one of, I can't remember if it was the one that we shot in Brooklyn or one that we shot, um, which was actually, which was actually Boston doubling for Brooklyn, but we, we filmed up in Massachusetts, but it was one of those scenes where I fight with her. It was either the one in the kitchen of the Brooklyn townhouse or in, at the, at the home when I, when I come home, we just did it over and over again. A lot of takes, a lot of coverage. And, uh, and, and we finished and we just kind of collapsed into each other's arms and Francis hugged me and she said, just remember, your mother loves you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I mean, we both started crying and uh, it was beautiful. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. As I've talked to people over the years, I've heard it both ways in terms of a really funny project movie or TV show or something. Oftentimes it's not very funny behind the scenes, but on a darker project, I would imagine you have to lighten things up when you when you finish the scenes. You absolutely have to. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's torturous. You know, you, you get, um, you really can feel stuck and, and get kind of bogged down. Um, you know, I did a play years ago called Rabbit Hole that uh, they turned into a great film uh, as well. But I did this play with John Slattery and Cynthia Nixon, and um, uh, and it was a really heavy, you know, I intense play about a, a you know a, a couple whose whose young son dies very tragically in, a, in an accident when he's a toddler, and it's all about dealing with that grief and everything. And uh, and going out, especially in a play or or a, a movie that takes a long time when you really are living in it, you know, going out on stage every night and doing something that's really that dark and that uh, that uh, tormented, it was very you know important to us to kind of lighten the load and lighten the mood backstage, um, which luckily is is uh, if you've got uh, John Slattery around is good because he's a really funny guy. We haven't talked much about Richard Jenkins, who plays your father. He's one of my favorite actors for many, many years. And yeah. I hope he doesn't go, get overlooked by the Emmy voters because his role is not showy, but it's just perfect for this oh, kind of part. Yeah, yeah. He, he nailed it. I mean, he absolutely nailed it, uh, you know, and, and m myself as well. I've been a fan of his for, for, for years from some of his smaller, you know, more character actory days to, you know, stuff like The Visitor, which he was brilliant in. And, and um, I, I adore him. Uh, he's an amazing person and uh, a great, great actor. And and like you said, it is. It's it's no nonsense. It's it's not very showy. It's very very simple. It's very even keeled, but it's very real in that sense. 
you know, you really feel like, oh, I know, I know this guy. I absolutely know this guy. And I know what he's going through. I know how he's feeling, even though he's not, you know, he doesn't have all, he doesn't kind of wear his heart on his sleeve. You know, he has a few cards uh, that are kind of hidden, you know. But uh, I just remember filming, you know, we filmed the scene that takes place at my character's, um, you know, uh, the dinner before um, my character gets married. And, and Richard gets up and, and his character it gives a little toast. And we hadn't really done a lot of rehearsals. We had done some rehearsing. I had gotten there early and, done, and, and kind of read through the whole script with, with Francis and Richard. But when we were filming, we didn't really do a ton of rehearsing. We would just kind of get ready, and then we would start shooting. And so there's that magical moment where you don't really know how things are going to go, or how, 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 is it, how are people going to do their lines? How are, how's the scene going to come to life? And then I remember it was the first thing that I shot with him. He got up and gave this speech. And, and I was watching it. It's kind of one of those moments where I suddenly was like, oh, my gosh, I, I just zoned out. And I, John Gallagher, just, you know, was watching this brilliant moment from this actor that I admired. And it's one of those moments where I, you know, I had to pinch myself a little and because um, I really felt lucky to be on set with people that I admire that much. Well, I hope you get in on the supporting side there for the uh, limited series, and, and he and uh, Francis will be up on the lead side. Let's talk about the newsroom. It finished up its third season back a few months ago. I, I've asked other people this, and I, for some reason, a lot of shows are ending this year. So I've had, like, the Justified people on ending their show and, and others, and, I, and I've asked each one this, and I'll ask you this. How do you say goodbye to a character you played for a while like Jim Harper? It's that's a very good question. It's kind of strange. It's it's there's almost kind of like it's a long kind of mourning period in a in a strange way. Um, so you kind of yeah you build this character and you get into it and you do it for several years and then all of a sudden it it feels like you're kind of sidelined all of a sudden by the idea that it's that, that you have to leave it behind and you know move move, move on from it and so. It's strange because you finish filming, and that's kind of one part of the mourning process. Uh, and so then you have to kind of also mourn just the sadness of not being around these great people that you get to work with, you know, all the time. Uh, and then the show comes back on and it airs, and then you kind of have to go through that part of the of the mourning where everyone's still watching it. So you have kind of started saying your goodbyes, but the audience hasn't started saying their goodbye quite yet. They're in the process of it. And it takes months, honestly. It, you know, we we finished filming in July of last year, so almost a year now um, since you know since we finished filming. And it, it hasn't been until honestly, I feel the last month or two that I really feel like, oh, now I'm that that is starting to come off. I'm I'm shedding that, you know, um, in a sense. I just had that conversation with somebody a few nights ago, as a matter of fact, that I thought, oh wow, I think I'm. It's really just now catching up. And uh, and dawning on me that it's that it is the end of an era that it's over, um, so it's it's intense. I was just, I've been watching you know Mad Men all week because I, I adore that show, and I've been thinking about that. You know they they we did three seasons in the newsroom, but they really have had such a such a long stretch doing that show. And I thought, gosh, you know all those characters are so complex. All those actors are in it. They're it's it's comforting in a way knowing that it, you know they're out there kind of going through that morning process as well of saying goodbye to your character that you love that you get to play for several years. I really loved how the finale allowed you and Jeff and some of the others that have a musical background to have that musical moment there in the garage. Totally. Yeah, you know, Aaron had kind of threatened us for three years that he was really going to do it, uh, a scene that involved us singing and playing because he found out that I play guitar and I write music and Jeff plays guitar and writes music. And, uh, and he heard that song, that Tom T. Hall song, That's How I Got to Memphis, and fell in love with it and decided that he wanted to write it into the episode. And so the cool thing about that was that we got to work with this guy, Buddy Miller, uh, who is an amazing singer-songwriter, incredible musician, producer. He works on producing a lot of the music for the TV show Nashville. And um, he's played with everyone. He's played with Emmy Lou Harris and, and Willie Nelson and some of my you know legends and the heroes. And... Uh, uh, I was geeking out pretty hardcore. He was the one that came in and recorded us. So we got to go into the studio with him and uh, and record that song, which was really fun. It was it was one of those surreal moments where you, you think, oh, wow, I, I didn't realize that this is where this job was going to take me, that I was going to be in a recording studio with 
Aaron Sorkin and Jeff Daniels and Buddy Miller working on a Tom T. Hall cover. You know, it's it's uh, unexpected. Very cool. You can't predict from moment to moment in your business. Oof, you have no idea what's coming. You, you know, you, you like to kind of kid yourself that you've got some control over it, but it's just like life. You know, it's uh, it, it, you kind of have to roll with it and see what comes, see what happens next. Well, the nice thing about that moment was, you know, sometimes on a show, oh, here's our big musical number, or here's our big musical. That one just felt so organic, like you all thought of it on the spot. Oh, good. That's what we, you know, that's what we were going for. Because I do know that sometimes that. Yeah, when when you gear up for that moment, it's like here comes the song, and then kind of immediately takes it takes you out of it because it stops feeling real. Um, but yeah, we wanted it to just feel like something that just came together. Like one guy picks up a guitar, the other guy comes in and joins in, and the next thing you know, everyone's gathered around. So I'm glad I'm, that's great to hear that it we had, it had the desired effect. Well, the other great thing about that episode was, and Aaron's very good at these kinds of things. He did it on The West Wing a lot. It took took the because it was the finale, and you knew it was the finale. It took back to before we met all of these characters and how they kind of all came together. Yeah, I love that. I love the you know season. I think I can't remember which season it is on the West Wing, but when it goes back to the campaign, um, it's one of my favorite episodes when they start doing that because he is really good at flashbacks. You know, he is a kind of a flashback master, and uh, I always wondered if he was going to do that. Like when we were doing the first season, I thought, I wonder how if he's ever going to do one, and how far back is he going to go. And when I got that last script, I remember I was sitting, I was having dinner by myself uh, at this restaurant in LA and uh, my phone went off and I checked it and it was the final script, you know, because we were going to film it in a, in a week or two. And I sat there and I ate by myself and I read the last script and as the flashback started rolling in, I was like, oh, here it goes. He saved it for the end, but we still get to go back in time. Well, I hate that show is gone. There's, there's so few just brilliantly smart, witty, dialogue oriented shows anymore. Yeah, yeah. I know. I was I was certainly sad to see it go as well. You know, you sign up for these things and you never know how long they're going to last. You know, if you're going to do five seasons, six seasons, seven seasons, you know, and we did three, which is short but sweet. Um, and uh, so definitely it, it was a, you know, it was kind of, it, it felt like an early goodbye, but it just, it felt like it was kind of time. It was like, oh yeah, you know, kind of had our, had our day. And uh, now, you know, it's exciting to see um, with all of these shows coming to a close, it really has been a pretty intense year in the last two years, saying goodbye to, you know, Breaking Bad, which is one of my favorite shows, and saying goodbye to Boardwalk Empire, which I love. Now saying goodbye to to uh, to Mad Men. It's been, it's, it's been rough. It's been heavy. But it, it's exciting because it's like, oh, wow, I wonder what what is out there, you know, what's out there waiting in, in the wings from, you know, the next generation. Well, I mentioned off the top, you know, we're an awards website, so I've got to hear about your Tony Awards moment. Tell sure, us, yeah. tell us uh, I'm sure you don't get tired of telling that story. Oh, man. Yeah, that was really something. Uh, I was 22 years old, uh, and uh, Spring Awakening, the show that I started at the Atlantic Theater Company, had moved to Broadway to the Eugene O'Neill Theater. And it had started very humbly down at, in a 200-seat theater off Broadway in Chelsea, the Atlantic Theater Company, which is an incredible theater. I've done three plays there. And we didn't think it was going to go to Broadway. We, we loved the show. We all believed in it. Um, but it was, it, it's, it, you know, in that way that you said about Olive Kittredge, it, it's a heavy piece. It deals with some really intense, uh, it's intense and kind of sad and very violent issues. And so we didn't know that if it would speak to a bigger audience, but the producers took a gamble and they moved it to Broadway and we ended up getting, I think, 11 Tony nominations. And so when we all started getting nominated and when I got nominated and then when I won and the show won for Best Musical, we were just so blown away because you think back to it a year before that, you know, where were you? Well, we were down in a little theater uh, off Broadway and we were so excited because you know, our, our run was selling out and we were getting all these extensions put on the run so that we could do more performances. But I never thought for a second that we were gonna A, move to Broadway, and even if we got to Broadway, there's no guarantee that you'll stay open on Broadway. Uh, and even if you stay open on Broadway, there's no guarantee that, you know, the awards um, will be kind to you. And all of those things ended up happening, and it was a total surprise. But I still think back to, I remember, um, uh, Benjamin Walker, uh, who is a, a very talented actor, he came to see us at the Atlantic Theater Company, and I talked to him, 
about the show afterwards. He said, oh man, the show is great because he had done a, a workshop of it once um, back in the day. He said, the show is in great shape and he said, uh, it's going to go to Broadway. And I said, I don't, I don't know about that. And he said, not only is it going to go to Broadway, it's going to go to Broadway. You're going to win a Tony for it. Uh, and I don't know, I can't even, that's, I can't even think about that. And uh, he was totally right. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever run into him again to, to say thanks for his um, endorsement <laughs> and his support. But it was crazy. It really is like um, I went with my sister, Joni, and uh, she, I sat next to her and I sat next to my agent. And the day leading up to it, I, I had been in the dressing room with our music uh, ar uh, arranger and, uh, and and who played the piano, Kim Grigsby, and was also our, our vocal director and everything on the show. And Steven Spinella, who's a really, really incredible, talented, Tony Award winning actor himself, who was, was in Spring Awakening with me, he came running in and he said, oh, you know, the New York Times has, uh, has um, they've all pegged you for the winner tonight, because you know, we were going to the Tony Awards later in the day. I was like, no, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't even want to think about it, I couldn't, it just, it's just something that you know, in my only in my wildest dreams, uh, did I think could could ever happen. And when they, yeah, when they certainly when they called my name, it was a, it was I, I you hear I I heard people say this when you when you listen to people talk about you know getting an honors such as that that you know you kind of it's like an out of body experience. And it really is. Um, I barely remember it. Uh, I I kind of it's 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 kind of hazy. It's like a dream almost. And uh, and then I you know. The, the best part was that my parents were, were there as well. They sat further in the back, but my, um, my, my parents and my sister um, were there, which was really exciting and, and really special. And uh, yeah, it was a total, total kind of life-changing moment, but then at the same time, nothing really changes, um, which is kind of the elusive beauty about being given an honor. You know, it's something uh, that is just really exquisite and, and uh, uh, it's, it's something that I forget, you know, like I, I forget it. You know, you, you don't really necessarily walk around thinking, I'm a Tony Award winning actor. Yes, you know, but <laughs> every now and then, you know, you talk to someone such as yourself and you go, oh, right, right, you know. And you have to think back on that summer and, uh, and how exciting it was. It's not something you carry around with you. No, I, I, I remember making jokes that I was going to like, you know, turn it into a necklace and wear it around, but uh, it's, uh, it's, in a, it's in my storage space. <laughs> <laughs> Will so there ever be a feature next film? Next time I move, I'm going to take it out and put it somewhere and display it. But. Will there ever be a feature film of, of that musical? You know, there is one in development. I don't, know, I don't know where they are in the process, but I do know that they've been working on it for uh, quite some time, and uh, I think that it could be a really exciting, exciting film. And uh, uh, you know, we, the cool part about it is that you know we're all too old now. The original cast, we we couldn't do it because um, we were in our late teens, early twenties, playing teenagers. The thing that I'm really excited about for the movie is that much like we all started it, you know, in that young place, and we were all kind of unknown talents. Now people have gone on to do all kinds of stuff. Jonathan Groff and Leah Michelle, and Skylar S and Phoebe Stroll, to name a few. They've done such amazing things and are kind of household names now. Um, I think it's going to be really exciting when that movie gets made to to watch a new generation and a new group of young people kind of come and and uh, make their mark. I can tell you're a big theater fan, even on projects you're not involved in. What's what's the best show you've seen? What's the best show? Other I've, than ones you were in. The other ones that I've. Um, one, one of, I'm trying to think, a uh, couple of things that really stayed with me. There is a play called The Aliens. It's by a playwright, um, Annie Baker, who's a wonderful New York playwright. That remains one of my all-time favorite things I think I've seen uh, in, in New York. And uh, one of my favorite things recently I just saw was the Signature Theater, which is a really amazing off-Broadway theater uh, in New York City. They did a revival of a, um, a Charles Mead play called Big Love recently, and I saw that a few times, and that was excellent. And uh, a couple musicals that, that really stayed with me, was they did a revival of uh, this musical Assassins in 2004, and uh, that was probably one of the, that was a moment where I remember looking and just thinking, this is one of the best ensembles that I've ever seen on, on stage. 
um, the revival of um, Hedwig that's out right now on Broadway. Hedwig and the, and the Angry Ants, which is a fantastic musical by uh, um, John Cameron Mitchell, who recently went back to do the show, and I got to see it a couple weeks ago, and that was that was pretty incredible. That felt like a I'm gonna remember this. That was one of those moments where I think I was like, I'll be telling that story years from now. I'll be like, I saw John Cameron Mitchell come back to Broadway and do it. And they just announced that he's getting a special um, achievement uh, Tony Award for that revival and for that performance, which is really exciting. I think, yeah, I think that was uh, certainly for his efforts, but also they had changed the rule because of last year when it won for revival. Revival, yeah. He wasn't eligible as one of the you know people involved, so it's kind yeah. of their way of giving him a Tony for that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> which is, a, which is a, it's a, that's a, a pretty cool honor. He's a, he's such a special force um, in New York theater, you know, and and there's so much, you know, a show like like Hedwig, you know, it paved the way for. Uh, you know, for shows like Spring Awakening and for these little things that could start in a small theater and the idea that they could get, you know, noticed enough to make the transfer to Broadway was really exciting. So it's cool that he's getting that, that honor. He's a, he's, a, he's a special talent. One last question, music related still. You were also in the uh, American Idiot Green Day musical. Yeah. What were your thoughts on them? Uh, they just got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a couple of weeks ago. So exciting. I'm thrilled for them. Um, working with them was incredible. I had been uh, a big Green Day fan before I worked with them on, on American Idiot. And I remember one of the one of the most starstruck I think I've ever been in my life was when we were doing Spring Awakening and Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day came to see it. And that was how he met Michael Mayer, who then went on to develop and direct the American Idiot musical that I, that I did with them. And uh, you know they're they're like technically um, young, like one of the youngest you know inductees, I guess, um, because they you started. You had a, a release twenty five years before, but they started when they were teenagers. So yeah, yeah they're like early forties now, right? Yeah, I just read. In fact, it's funny that you bring it up because right before I I got on this chat, I was on my phone reading a little interview that Billy Joe did with Rolling Stone, and it's really interesting. And he talks about how surreal it was, uh, you know, that getting that honor and, and being in, inducted. Um, the, the crazy thing about any type of award ceremony like that is that it's just, it never, it will never cease to amaze me when I get to go to something like that, when I just get to look around and see all of my idols, you know, it's kind of, it's a, it's a humbling and, and crazy thing. I can only imagine what it must feel like for them um, getting that honor. And it's exciting too because it's like we're, we're gonna get, you know, they're still together too. Like we're gonna get more Green Day records. Um, they're gonna keep doing more stuff. And that's exciting that it's like, wow, they can, they, they've got that honor, but they're gonna keep, you know, they're gonna keep on kicking. And then the world gets to get more music from them, which is super exciting. Yeah, it could be similar to, I remember when Steven Spielberg got the AFI Life Achievement Award and he was, I think, the youngest. He was like late 40s, and one of the people that came out and spoke said, I imagine we'll all be together in another 40 years to give him a second Life Achievement Award. Yeah, <laughs> that would be cool. So maybe that'll happen for Green Day. Well, I hope I hope you get to go to the Emmys this uh, September, and there's a whole like Olive Kitteridge section there uh, yeah. with all of you nominated. I would love that. That would be really great. It would be great to go. It would be amazing if the family could all go, if the, if the Kitteridges can be reunited. <laughs> We might, based on the the uh, the way that that thing un, un, uh, developed on screen, we might have to separate all of you, though. I, right? Yeah, I know exactly. It, might, it would be a, a pretty strange. We wouldn't be sitting together if it was a true Olive Kitteridge uh, family. Right, exactly, we'd be sitting very far apart. Well, listen. Thank you so much for your time today, and good luck with that. Thank you so much.